Hello and welcome to KennyRoy.com. I'm Kenny Roy. This is the lecture for the month of March 2014. Welcome to uh, the site to everybody. And I uh, hope you have a great time while you're here. Um, I normally use the lectures as a good opportunity to um, go in-depth in an animation demo. Um, but this is a topic that I feel so strongly about that I thought I would um, start talking to you guys um, on this level in this venue uh, this month. And uh, we'll be back to your regular scheduled programming in the month of April. It's also been a very crazy time for me. Uh, I've sold my house, um, doing a lot of rearranging in my life. But uh, the show must go on here, and I super appreciate uh, you guys being here, and I love doing this. So um, we are just going to keep rocking and rolling, okay? This lecture is called Tell a Story, and it's for a very specific reason. Um, I am wrapping up The Little Painter. And um, nobody has seen anything yet, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit of the first look. This is a sneak peek, a sneak peekarooski, as we say in the business. That's not what it's called. I made that up just now. I um, want to show you the look. And you guys haven't, uh, you probably have seen the little, like, three seconds of the uh, apartment of Pierre's apartment that I put on Facebook but you haven't seen this you haven't seen this this is the actual look this is the this is um, how the paint um, sort of comes to life on on uh, on canvas okay so check this out I'm gonna mute it so that it doesn't the sound doesn't distract you but at any rate um, this is the canvas that um, Pierre is painting on and how, well, I'll just show you, and you can see. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that gorgeous? Oh, I just love it. So I'm um, having so much fun finishing up this film, and I can't wait to show it to everybody. I can't wait for you guys to see it. And love it or hate it, um, it's been a, a huge part of um, of my life, and been just uh, kind of permeating all areas of my my life and and um, and work. I I'm reminded about uh, this moment early on in my career. Very early on, it was the second job I ever got. And there was this um, producer named Mark, and I'll never remember what he said. I never remember. I'll always remember what he said. I'll never forget. Um, he said a lot of things to me that I'll, I'll never forget. Um, one was, uh, "Hey, Kenny, I'm not paying you to drink hot chocolate. Get back to work." That was a funny moment. Um, but one thing he said to me, he looked over my shoulder, and even though I was only working on um, like graphics, like like Photoshop 3.5 um, for the background for like the 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 jumbotron is going to be composited in the background of the movie for Love of the Game. Even though I was just working on that kind of stuff, um, uh, he came behind me and he looked over my shoulder and he and I I said, uh, "What do you think?" And he's like, "You know what." Tell a story. Never pass up an opportunity to tell a story. And he walked away. And I thought to myself, well, that's dandy advice. That's that's wonderful. Thank you for that. But what 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 story can I tell? You know, with these these back like these graphics. Like, what can how how can I how can I do that? There was another artist there. And I have forgotten his name. It was exotic. It was like a Safi or or a Srafi or something like that. And um, he said, 
Well, think about th think about it this way. The the jumbotron they they don't they don't have a lot of time to put to to you know throw these graphics together. So you have to make it look really 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 good but at the same time make it look like it works with you know what they have like in the minor leagues so it has to be a completely perfectly faithfully reproduced kind of like crappy graphic if that makes any sense and and you know sort of the the better you do at that the more of a story you're telling i thought it was a little bit of a stretch and maybe it was a little bit of a stretch. It wasn't so much later when I started animating on, on feature films when I started hearing that kind of thing again. Tell a story, tell a story, tell a story. And truly, my exposure to the uh, feature film world was pivotal in uh, instilling in me this sense that there's always a little bit more that you can put into everything that you do and it's not necessarily you know for like an animation just like polishing the, you know just like the overlap on the tip of the pinkies and making sure that there's no intersection in the eyelids in a shot uh, a character that's like way in the background of a shot that's 14 frames long you know th th that's not putting in more Putting in more is telling more of a story. It's just like that crappy Jumbotron graphic that I was photoshopping. It's faithfully reproducing every single aspect of that moment. That's what's telling, for me, that's what is telling a story. You have to know a little bit about story, though, in order to do that. And so I, I thought I would also take this first moment or this not the first moment that I've had to do this but I, I thought I would make this the first moment to tell you um, or remind you if you already know about it about my book coming out um, in May called finish your film tips and tricks for creating an animated short film in Maya and it's on Amazon and um, Amazon's loading really slowly right now I'm gonna bring up the Amazon page for you guys but um, what I sought to do with this book was to give animators who are proficient in Maya the extra technical and workflow uh, instruction that you need to make a film from start to finish. Now, it's going to be a very, 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 very simple film to begin with. And there, you, you're going to get better, and you're going to have more technical prowess, and you're going to have more, uh, you know, uh, creative prowess as you go on, and as you as you do more and more and more and more. Here's the uh, Amazon page. Finish your film tips and tricks for making an animated short in Maya, and uh, it comes out in May. Publication date May seventh, and there's going to be a few changes here on KennyRoy.com. Um, to accommodate the people that are, are reading this book. And I'm going to begin to offer um, some sort of, uh, I don't know what I'm going to call it yet, but it's going to be sort of like co-direction on, on short films. If people are using this book or are going through on their own a short film, I want to offer a place, a space, where we can talk about your progress and, um, and offer that kind of... Uh, you know, uh, that, that help on that level. It also goes into um, story, and it is not a replacement for a, a you know, a college or higher education um, creative writing course by any stretch of the imagination. But there is a technique in this book that I teach you how to do that I think really supremely practices that tell a story um, uh, muscle and if anyone anyone knows it or is in the anim gym right now you know that I am really 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 on a on an exercise like kick right now I I think that exercising 
is the the dopest thing you can possibly do. Stop trying to get better. Stop trying to learn while creating something epic and massive. Um, you're going to you're going to choke yourself to death. <laughs> I'll tell you a small anecdote from uh, my time as a um, story mentor at uh, AM when they had the short film program and also as a mentor of class six which was the short film production um, uh, uh, course. Um, uh, they were very nice. They let me bring my short film, my, 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 my story course from, from class five. They let me stay with them all and, and do class six with them. And then I would go back and start with a new class five and then move on to class six with them. So it was very, very, very um, nice that they were allowing me to do that. What it let me do, what, why this was great, was because I could sort of instill this story exercise and then see it um, play out. I'll tell you the anecdote now though. When they started the short film program, AM had um, some loose rules on what kind of film you could create. I had a very strict rule and they never stopped me from implementing this strict rule or enforcing this strict rule. The loose rule was don't make anything too epic, don't make anything that is like longer than one or two minutes and listen to your mentor in terms of what the, what the uh, you know, story should be. My strict rule was you can create, you can write any length of story you want. I don't care. You can write a story that is, that is two minutes long, ten minutes long. I don't care. But you have to know that you are only attempting 30 seconds of animation in class six. It was eight weeks, 30 seconds of animation in class, or sorry, it's 12 weeks. Sorry, animation mentor is 12 weeks 12 week, um, per semester. I believe, yes, 12 weeks, okay? So in gen roughly about three seconds a week, all right, of production. Now, that's a super slow pace. That's even slower than like Pixar, Pixar pace. But this is what ended up happening. Anyone who attempted to do more than 30 seconds, so let's say you tried to do a minute of animation only finished about 20 seconds of animation and the other 40 seconds of animation in their one minute long film took them like a year. Anyone who attempted 30 seconds of animation of their one minute long film finished 30 seconds of animation and the other 30 seconds took them another 12 weeks. Took them another, you know, three months or so. So they had a finished film in six months. Now why is that? Turns out that if you're trying to learn at the same time as doing more than you can do, you accomplish neither. You have to give yourself the opportunity to, like last, last month's lecture, you have to give yourself an opportunity to experiment to break your workflow and make new workflow choices based on those, those errors. And you have to do it at a pace that you're not pushing yourself faster than you can absorb the experience that you're in the middle of. Because everyone knows if you are working so fast and furiously that you're not, able, not even able to breathe, then you're not actually absorbing the experience. It's just rushing by you and you're hanging on, you know, by a thread, hanging on to the seat of your pants and nothing is being learned. This is very, very, very well known, well documented. Okay. Now, all that said, that being the case, all right, I was ruthless with this rule. People would come to me with epic films. I said, that's fantastic. What 30 seconds are you going to do? Kind of bummed them out. Honestly, it would probably bum me out too if I, if I didn't know any better. But I stuck to it. And I saw a lot of, lot of animation that, was, that was, was fantastic and they all finished. They all got that, that 30 seconds done. You know, six, seven shots, whatever it was, they got, they got it all done. Really, really fun. So 
how does that apply to what we're doing right here? Well, first of all, I am obviously really into practicing. I've been pushing you guys to practice. I've been pushing you guys to do the Anim Gym, pushing you towards these things, these choices, these ideas. But on top of that, what this allowed them to do was to free their minds and not think that their story needed to be constrained to a short story uh, just because that, that, you know, if they were only ever going to do 30 seconds, then you don't have to worry about, well, my entire film needs to be this small idea, this small thing that I can do in 12 weeks. That was the major problem. The majority of students, when they th were thinking about what film am I going to do, their, their, their breakdown would be, oh man, I just can't think of anything that's simple enough, or I can, but I really I just don't want to do it. It just doesn't sound fun. It doesn't sound, sound great. Little Painter is five minutes long. It's, it's actually epic. There's six main characters, um, five minutes long, um, about six or seven different environments. Um, but as you saw, though, the environments make very, very creative use, I like to think, of the, the look, the, the painterly feel of it. And um, we kind of like are, are playing with just like a little bit of a splash of color and that's it. But, it, but that, all that aside, um, I, I wouldn't have come up with the little painter had I been told from the get-go, oh, well, you need to come up with, you know, a story that's like a minute long and, you know, only a couple characters and a couple environments and, and whatever. I, I think it's a much better thought exercise to let your mind go and to really think critically, what is a better story? Like from this point onwards, how can I make it better? How can I make it better? How can I, how can I improve it? How can I be a better storyteller myself? and not which character can I lose or which, which environment do I need to you know, ax from the script or is this entire thing too big? Let me think of something simpler and, and, and put this aside. It's much more fun to imagine. It's much more fun to be free, isn't it? We want to. We should. So uh, this is what that allowed uh, the, the animators to do. Now the exercise that I'm talking about <laughs> Um, there's actually two, but they, they, they tie into each other. One helps the other one out. Um, but the exercise I'm talking about is the theme and moral feedback loop. Okay? Theme and moral feedback loop. Those two things, theme and moral, theme and moral. Now, I used to be a little bit upset because the, um, the curriculum that was, that was taught talked about moral in a way that uh, I, I, I fundamentally disagree with. What most people think about moral is, is sort of almost a summary of what happens. So we've all heard of the um, fable where um, there's a mouse and the lion catches the mouse and the mouse pleads for his life and he says, you should let me go because someday I might be able to help you. And the lion thinks this is so funny. And he rolls around laughing and he, and he lets go of the mouse. And um, it's just, this is so hysterical. Well, lo and behold, later on, the mouse hears this gigantic roar. And he sees the lion is covered with a net. He's been caught by a, a hunter and the hunter is coming. And the mouse chews through the ropes and, and frees the lion thereby proving um, all along that he um, could be a friend and was useful. Now, most people say that the moral of that story is that you should, um, well, there's a lot of different ways you could put this. I'm going to give, give a few. You should, you know, um, not uh, uh, judge somebody based on their size. You should... Um, uh, you you never know, you know, you never know who's going to um, help you in a pinch. Um, don't if don't don't um, uh, almost like don't look a gift gift horse in a mouse. If somebody's off, if someone's offering you help, you know, always, always, uh, always take it when it's offered. You could you could you could pin a lot of different morals onto this 
um, story. Um, but the way that n most people come up with the morals of the story um, kind of bothered me because it felt a lot too, uh, too much like a summary of the events. And that's not what really the moral is. And so this is where the theme versus moral feedback loop comes, comes up. And I talk about this in the book. And I really think that it is a great way to exercise your story skills and in your work, in your animation, or whatever you're working on. Hopefully it's animation. Um, what, it, what it will help you do, my, my, my sincere wish, is to apply the, the tenets of this, this idea to your work and get to that deeper story. Right, that producer Mark looking over your shoulder, tell a story, tell a story, tell a story, and um, it has application. You may not, you may not think so at first, but it has application across the board. All right, so here's how it works. The moral is not the summary of events. It is not basically what is learned at the end. Okay. All right. Certainly not what is learned by the characters themselves. Right? Certainly not what is learned by the characters. The characters going through their experience actually display the moral for the audience. It's what the audience learns if anyone learns anything. But it doesn't even need to be what the audience uh, learns exactly. To find the moral, you have to start at the very beginning. What is the film about? A good way to put that into a single word is the theme. A theme can be really anything. The best themes are a single word. They are a thought or a concept or a section of our experience, a, a very, very neatly compartmentalized slice of humanity that has, if hopefully, that has little or no bleeding into it, little or no other concepts that are attached to it that sort of muddy it up, okay? So one theme could be love, but love is a very, very, very difficult theme because love is almost not an emotion, but a, like an entire state. It's almost a filter on all other emotions. Right? So is anger. Anger is really not quite its own emotion. It's actually a filter on top of, of, of other emotions. Right? It's extreme uh, jealousy or it's extreme surprise or extreme betrayal or whatever. Um, love is almost the same way. But if you get a little bit away from those massive concepts and to a little bit more uh, sectioned off, you get into themes like honor. Honor is a lot smaller of a concept than love is and it's a lot easier to sort of um, buffer it from the concepts, the, the rest of the concepts, the rest of our experience. Trustworthiness. Motherhood and fatherhood. Those are, those are halfway between. Those are sort of large in turn you know compared to the the uh, ones like honor and and trustworthiness but they are small definitely compared to love but um, definitely definitely good themes uh, greed any of the deadly sins could be a very 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 good theme okay now why we need to first apply what we understand as the theme of a of a uh, of a film or of a story is because we don't get to really see the moral until we know what the film is about. What is it really about? I love Finding Nemo because it is such a um, interesting um, uh, a film. The the uh, writer and director did um, a fa fantastic job really translating the theme from humans to fish, didn't they? Um, 
and um, now that I'm a dad and I'm on a you know playground and I I see you know you know moments happen every single second where I want to like jump in and and, and you know save my son from certain death. Um, I kind of I, I feel the same thing that Andrew Stanton did. If you were talking about, let's say you're going to do the live action version of of Finding Nemo, well, that would be kind of fun to watch. But really, I mean, in our human experience, we only have so many tools at our disposal to show to an audience that doesn't understand the theme of fatherhood uh, uh, what you know, like the the extreme highs and lows, and the and the real depth of the feelings that you that you feel. So. I remember in an interview or uh, behind the scenes or something that Andrew Stanton was was um, sitting on a playground and he saw his kid was on a, a, a merry-go-round and there was some big kids that were like making it go super, super fast and his kid was very small and he wanted to jump up and get him off of this thing because he was going to get hurt. Um, I remember, I, 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 I think this was also t- uh, talked about, I went to a talk at some point and um, I think Andrew Stanton was there, and he was talking about um, a, uh, a toy store. Another example of, of the feelings of fatherhood, where you know you'll be in a toy store and you're holding onto their their hand, and you'll just like reach and let go for one second. You turn around and they're gone. It's like they vanished. There's no physical way that they could have like gone all the way down this, this, this 200 foot aisle and disappeared, but they did. They are gone. And it, and it freaks them out every single time. What can you do to show the, the depth, the real depth and the, the magnitude of the feeling that you get when your kid like disappears as a father? in a toy store well you can pretty much show it at face value and a lot of films have right a lot of live action films have and you know only to you know the the dad's running up and down the aisles looking calling his name he can't figure out what's going on then all of a sudden he starts looking at all these people all these adults they look they all of a sudden seem scary now because his kid is gone and there's the the you know the janitor who's got the wiry mustache and in the the weird eyebrows and oh my god did he take him and then the 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 person that's like walking out the door oh my gosh is he holding him like where did he go and then he discovers oh he's hiding you know in a in a ball pit and, and the kid pops out and the balls fly everywhere and, and you know, he hugs his dad and there's a sigh of relief. In that moment, you know, you, you, as good as the photography could be, as, as brilliant as the editing could be, as, as expertly as it could be directed and, and, and well written and then directed and acted, you can only ever get to your audience the way that they will allow you to access them, won't you? Because it's a human, you're telling a human story on a human level. So if they are not sympathetic people, then they're only going to react to it pretty much the way they would react to it if they saw it happen right in front of their faces at a toy store. In fact, probably at a toy store, if they saw this happen, the kid and the dad, they're reunited, that sense of relief, they would would sympathize a lot more, they would empathize, a lot more, and um, and that's the best you can hope for. That's the best you can do, right? That film, that that live action version of it, tell, using humans to tell this human story, would be, you know, probably just a little bit less of a reaction with everybody. But now, what if I ask you, what if instead of a father? I'm 6'3", so a 6'3 dad and a, you know, a 2 foot 8 toddler disappearing in a toy store that's maybe 20,000 square feet. Why don't you make it a clownfish? They're this big, losing his baby clownfish in 100 trillion freaking gallons of water of the Pacific Ocean, filled with jellyfish turtles birds sharks submarines depth charges um uh everything else 
other fish that want to eat them, crabs, stinging rays, humans, okay? How much more are you usurping control in your audience's reaction when you change it from just uh, a couple of humans in a big but, you know, comparatively small toy store and just that 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 sense of loss that you get when you when you misplace your kid for a couple minutes and losing your freaking tiny disabled let's not forget he's handicapped um clownfish son in the entire pacific ocean all right now the feeling you get when your kid's hand slips out of your hand at the toy store or Disneyland or the park or whatever, and you turn around there and they're not there, is the feeling that you are a clownfish and they're a baby clownfish and they are lost in the entire Pacific with the depth charges and the sharks and the jellyfish and the turtles and all that, okay? It's the exact same feeling. That is the depth. So until you know your theme, you can't even begin to assign the other elements of storytelling, the, the characters, the environments, um, and, and what happens, the plot, basically, the, the, the rest of the, the picture here. Okay, But you also can't even assign the moral. So here's what the moral is. Once you've decided on a theme, you've decided on what the film is about. You then need to decide what do you think about the theme? What is your honest opinion? So to jump ahead and to put it quite simply, the moral is actually you're, as the creator, I'm just going to say if you're making a short film, you're the writer and creator. You're the writer and director and you're the creator. And you're probably an animator as well. Maybe you're modeling the characters, throw a couple of rigs on, make some textures. You're doing a lot, right? The moral is the creator's most succinctly put, simply stated, strongest opinion of the theme. And that's it. So thinking about Finding Nemo, what is the moral of the story? A lot of people uh, have come to the conclusion it's letting go. And that's very, 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 very good. That's very good. Okay? Why? Because, well, a little bit of cheating involved. Uh, the words let, you know, let go or let me go are spoken like three or four times in the in the film and visually we see lots of imagery where there's like hands holding and they let go or or something is 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 you know dropped or whatever um but only when the character performs in a way in the universe of the film where he is in agreement about the moral is the story resolved. So you can look at the resolution of the story. You can look at that moment right after the climax. You can look at that moment as to kind of give you a little bit of a hint if you're on track with what you think the moral of the story is. Okay? I'll tell you a very, very, very simple story. It's a story I like to tell. This guy walks up to a hot dog vendor and it looks like the hot dog vendor is blind. He's got dark shades on and he's kind of feeling around on his hot dog stand. Um, as the guy walks up, the guy doesn't think anything of it, orders a hot dog, gives him a dollar bill because it's only a dollar bill or 99 cent hot dog. And the guy gives him back a hundred dollar bill, a change. And the, 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 the customer looks at it and he looks at the vendor and kind of waves and sees that, you know, there's nothing in the dark glasses. So he just pockets that $100 bill, grabs his hot dog, takes a bite, gives a wink, 
takes a step off of the curb, and then bam, a bus <laughs> obliterates him, kills him. He's dead. And the last shot, we push in on the uh, the hot dog a vendor, and he takes his glasses and looks and gives us a wink and a little devil tail. Does a little flick behind him, and we pull out and fade to black. Right? Very simple story. Very, very, very simple story. Right? The devil sells hot dogs. <laughs> devil dogs. Right? Um, that customer really got punished really badly. Right? So when you analyze the theme and moral of this story, um, it's, it's very, very simple to do because the moment when the characters either agree or disagree with the moral, that's when everything kind of goes down. So the theme of this is greed and that customer being very, 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 very greedy held on to that, um, that $100 bill. You could also say that the, the theme touches on honor or honesty as well, but um, I think it's a little bit, uh, little bit more on the nose to say greed because he got everything that he wanted, um, the hot dog and the, and the money, okay? And that's just very, 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 very greedy. As the creator, you ask yourself, what is my strongest opinion? And if your opinion on greed is so strong, in other words, if you think that like being greedy is literally the worst thing that you can possibly be, then when a character is killed by a bus because they stole 100 bucks from a blind guy, you are unmistakably sending a message through this, the universe of your story that as the creator of your story, you're, you're almost like God, as it were, you know, of this universe that you've created, that on the top of your list is greed. And the second anyone steps over the line, they're going to get smited, right? I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my rope a little bit on the religious terms, so I'm going to switch back to just normal English, if you don't mind. <clears throat> so, very, very, very simple process, right? If you come to the end of the story, though, and you realize that you haven't stated as clearly or loudly or succinctly or simply your strongest opinion on that theme, well, then you need a better theme or you need to come up with a better opinion. It's that simple. The process of going from theme to your moral, so basically coming up with what's this film going to be about, what do I think about that? What happens to the characters that at that moment of, uh, of climax, something happens, something changes, or they do something that either agrees or disagrees with how I feel about this, and they're either rewarded or punished? And is that enough to clearly state my opinion? If not, go back and think about, is this film really about something else? Do I really like what happens? And do I really like what is learned enough that maybe I should go back and sort of fine tune what I, what I think this film is actually about? Did I start with, for instance, did I start with love? And when this guy gets the door slammed in his face a hundred times and, um, and uh, just can't seem to, to find anybody. And then finally, when he gives up on dating and, and is just walking home, you know, saves somebody falling out of a building and, you know, it's love at first sight or something. Um, I started out thinking it was a story about unrequited love, that it's a waste of your time to... Um, it's a waste of your time to, you know, spend time and, and effort on people who are, who are not going to love you back because you're special and you're worth it and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I set out to tell a story about unrequited love and here I am. 
well, if you like, if you've really, really, really fell in love with your ending where, where he catches this woman who literally falls out of the sky, then maybe your film is actually about, um, about looking for love or forcing love, right? You should stop trying to force it because it'll come to you, right? If you are open and like he holds his arms open, I'm already directing this in my head. He holds his arms open like, oh man, why can't I? And then whoom, like this woman falls out of a, like her, her burning building and, and he catches her or whatever. Maybe her hair is on fire and he goes and he blows it out. Sort of a little bit reminiscent of like a birthday candle. I don't know. I, maybe I'm going too far. Definitely does not pass the Bechtel test. <laughs> my, my film so far. I can fix it. We can get it back. Anyway, you start working with it and you say to yourself, okay, well, really now I, I'm actually feeling like this is about um, forcing, forcing love. Then what do you do? Well, all of the moments when he was knocking on doors and he like had a flower and then he had like a big bouquet and then he had like an entire rose bush and still just doors slammed in his face. As we were raising the stakes, um, we're not actually getting very exciting. We're not getting, as we're raising the stakes, we're not actually putting this guy through more and more and more that has to, that is going to force him to make an even bigger decision, an even larger adjustment or change to his behavior that will test the theme and then put on display the moral. Okay, so I just started talking about stakes and I don't want to jump around too much. But um, actually, I won't jump around. We'll come back to that in a second. So I just went through the entire process, the theme and moral feedback loop. Come up with what you think your film is about. Put your characters through the paces. Raise the stakes as you do so. When you start at the beginning and when you end at the end, they should be going through progressively more difficult situations or pro progressively higher stakes situations or have to make bigger sacrifices as they go or exert more effort as they go. It's always upwards. It's always climbing, okay? Until that very last moment when they have to either display agreement or disagreement with your opinion on the theme and whether they agree or disagree are rewarded or punished by you the creator when you get to the end if you are satisfied that you've done that then you're in great shape but if you are not satisfied and you shouldn't be on the first or second or third pass that your clear succinct strong opinion of that theme is not on full display then you go back and you ask yourself okay let me go all the way back to the theme and what more specific theme, what more tailored theme, uh, more aptly supports this story that I've made and I really like? Because that's what happens instantaneously. You come up with something and it's great and you really want to hang on to it. And that's okay. Some people will tell you that you shouldn't fall in love with anything. I think that there's a reason that we fall in love with stories that we come up with. I think it's because they're all good. They just need a little bit of work. Okay? So you, you keep what you love throughout the rest. And then when you arrived at hopefully a little bit more of a specific custom tailored theme that is a little bit more easily digestible slice of human experience, then you turn around and you march forward again. What new stakes, what new situations, what new experiences, what new choices, what new challenges are your characters going to have to overcome in order to succeed or fail? And hopefully the stakes are getting higher and higher and higher. Now, life and death life and death stakes, I'll talk about stakes now. Life and death stakes are not necessarily the highest stakes there are. They are ver very, 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 very high. And certainly, you know, if you sprinkle in a little bit of like, li you know, danger of death in your action, there's going to be, you know, some, you know, very, very exciting moments in your, in your film, doubtless, right? But... There are higher stakes than life and death. 
most people would rather be dead than like all of a sudden naked in front of a crowd. Rather die. I know I know I would. Right? Just up there, that's like one of my nightmares. You have that nightmare where you're like in front of the class and like you forgot your your speech. For me, it's being in a play. Um, I, I'm in the audience and I get called up and they're like, we need you to play this character. And it's a play I've never seen before. I have no idea what the lines are. And then the play just starts and I get pushed out and someone walks right up to me and says, oh, I'm so glad you're here, Mr. Mr. Crawford. Uh, what have you brought? And then boom, I'm naked. And the entire audience is waiting there. And I'm not sure what's worse, that I'm naked under the lights or that I, I, I don't know the, what the line is and I, I just want to die, right? That's really, really super high stakes. I'm not sure how that would, that would um, play out in a, in a short film. But um, you shouldn't, it's a little bit of a crutch to make everything life and death. I know I used it with the, uh, with the devil dogs, but um, that was just a quick example. It's easy to understand. So, so here's the deal. The theme moral feedback loop will give you a way to exercise your story muscle. It'll give you a method that you can use to take a sort of more analytical approach to your stories. And I want to encourage you guys. I think you should be writing stories. I think every animator at their core is a storyteller. I think you guys should be writing these down. Definitely moving forward, designing characters, getting together, talking, discussing. Um, and what I'd like to do um, at some point this year um, is to, in, in addition to, there's going to be a few changes around the site, you know, to, to accept these, you know, incoming people. And, and uh, obviously, KennyWare.com members who are reading the book as well. But um, I'd like to, at some point this year, actually pivot a little bit and make us a storytelling community. This has application into all of your animation, though. It is, it is so applicable, even on a shot-by-shot -shot basis, that you need, to, uh, you need to think more critically about what you're working on um, if, if you don't, don't believe that it does. We talk about, we've always talked about, um, when we're training animators, you know, what's the backstory here? You know, write a little backstory of your character. Write a little bit of a, you know, sort of like a, you know, leading up to this moment or whatever. Even if it's, even if it's a simple shot, you know, kind of like go into it and who is he and is he happy or sad or tired or whatever or whatever. Um, why not have every single choice you make play beautifully into this, this delicate but calculated climb from the beginning of the story to the end of the story to that moment when the entire plot comes together to either exalt or, or damn the person that agrees or disagrees with the, with the moral. Agrees or disagrees with the creator who put this person to the test, who created this situation and, and, and set up all these obstacles and challenges to overcome. And at the very end, what is, what is the right choice? Or what, what is the right uh, opinion of the, of the theme? Do they succeed? Yes or no? And they don't always have to succeed. Sometimes they fail. Like my guy got killed by a bus. Maybe they, maybe they do succeed. Right? Maybe in the, um, that was like a 30-second version of my film. Maybe in the minute-long version, instead... There's one person that, there's, there's two people getting hot dog at the exact same time. And the one sees the other one get the $100 bill and walk off. And then he gets a $100 bill and he looks and he's like, oh, no, 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 sir, no, no, this is $100. And he, he tries to show him and he realizes he's blind and he says, no, 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 forget it. And he just stuffs it back in his hand and he says thank you and, and even gives him a tip. Like gives him a $2 tip for like a $1 hot dog, right? Walks away, enjoys his hot dog, and then boom, the guy gets killed like right in front of him. He's like, oh my God, right? So there you have like, it shows both choices, whatever. Not necessarily a stronger story, honestly, just now. But still, what if every single one of your animation choices in your shots plays into, is cognizant, and, and is looking at that 
that gradual climb to that moment and honors it and plays plays into it like for instance in this short you would want this character to almost get seduced by the money maybe when they're walking up the you you don't start them off you know like walking up to this a uh, hot dog stand looking like an evil character looking like snidely whiplash you want them to you know kind of look and then when they see the hundred dollar bill they're about to maybe maybe they're just about to talk or you know tell the tell the vendor and then there's like a second where they kind of like realize like wait wait is he he is blind oh my god and then they kind of get a little bit transformed by the by the money and it, it's almost like you know the the one ring and their golem and and they they kind of change and how do they change is it just like a little bit in their face or no no think about it as an animator you have control over everything maybe they sort of like get a little bit hunched and, and evil and craggly and troll like and when they turn around that's when you can finally get into the in moment where they're taking like these like weird like nasty little steps and they they walk away like all all icky and nasty right right saving saving all of your visual tricks saving all of your motion tricks saving all of your animation for the right moment as it pertains to the revelation of that moral that's some top level animation stuff that is some high level duty okay now perhaps a little too high level to get into the a jumbotron graphic it's in the background of a, of a, of a feature film admittedly but the sentiment was right Mark's sentiment tell a story tell a story okay I want to give you another little tool. This is this is in the book as well. It's a little bit later in the chapter. Um, give you guys a little bit of a preview, but I, I I want to specifically give you this so that you can integrate this into your exercise. All right. I know there's you know about a dozen people that are consistently doing the anim gym, but um, I want uh, I want everybody to be practicing. All right. I want everybody to be putting your workflow to the test. Um, and here's another thing that you can do, right? To make it a little bit easier for you, one way that I like to think of stories and to be able to really, really quickly get through the theme moral feedback loop a lot of times is to use something called the modular middle. What the modular middle is, is it dawned on me that a lot of my favorite films, especially short films, but even, even some feature length films um, had an extremely strong beginning that set up that theme beautifully and a masterful ending that normally has a, a huge twist and I never saw it coming and it just like just puts like a golden stamp of that moral on the film on the film itself. But the middle seemed like it was a little bit modular. It seemed like, kind of like one shot could go and another could be put in its place and it, I wouldn't have been any wiser. Or I would have been none the wiser. In fact, some films almost felt like what I was seeing was a really almost edited, maybe like, almost like, you know, put together from the cutting room floor version of, of the film in the way that the, the middle was had this almost assembled quality to it okay so that's that's what i um started calling the modular middle and it makes a lot of sense here's why you have a theme and you need to know what your theme is so that you can set up your characters your environment and the plot but what really is the plot the plot is having people start in a certain situation, having them start with a certain relationship, um, 
or, or whatever the setup is, and then having them go through a change to get to that final moment, right? But that final moment is the ending. So really when you are coming up with your theme and your moral right off the bat, you're coming up with the beginning and the ending. The stakes are the middle. What you are showing the person progressively have more difficulty with or, 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 or progressively more um, challenging or, or just repeating the same thing over and over and, and having less and less success, whatever it is, however you're raising the stakes, that can be invented on the fly. It can be worked with and tweaked and massaged as you are doing the feedback loop so that you get stronger and stronger support for your moral and for your theme. So you can almost go around the horn much quicker if you decide beforehand that you have a modular middle. Um, this is from the book. I'm just going to read you a little bit of, uh, uh, from the book. I'm going to read you some, some, uh, some uh, short film ideas. Here we go. An old man sits down to play a game of chess with himself. He gets in increasingly excited as the pieces start falling. At the last second, he plays a trick on himself by spinning the board, stealing the win. A boy, his father, and grandfather set about their nightly task of sweeping up falling stars. When a massive star defies all attempts to clean it up, they seem stumped. Finally, the boy decides to smash the huge star, splitting it into thousands of smaller stars that the three begin to sweep up. A magician, in his rush to get out on stage, neglects to feed his rabbit. Unwilling to perform on an empty stomach, the rabbit puts the musician through increasing torment and embarrassment as he's smashed, pinched, punched, even electrocuted. It escalates until finally the rabbit saves the magician from certain death, eating his carrot. Uh, earning his carrot. My bad. Um, uh, one more. Up in the sky, we see that all baby animals are made from little clouds by puffy, vaporous beings before they are whisked away to their parents by storks. One stork, however, has the misfortune of, to have to deliver all of the dangerous animals of the world and looks increasingly ragged as he's poked, bitten, and shocked by tiny predators. Just when it looks like he's about to quit, though, he devises a plan and shows up for his next delivery wearing football pads and a satisfied grin. All right. Now, I probably didn't trick you at all with any of those um, plots. First one was Jerry's Game. Uh, second one was Luna. The third one was Presto. And the last one was uh, Partly Cloudy. These are all Pixar short films. Every single one, and, and, and there's, there's a lot more in the book, every single one uses the theme moral feedback loop and the modular middle to raise the stakes, to advance the plot, and to show us more and more and more and more and more clearly as we go on exactly what the, 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 the gravity of this choice that the character has to make. All right? Partly cloudy. I loved partly cloudy. I just loved the idea that this one kind of like harumphy looking cloud was making all the swordfish and the and, and the you know electric eels and the alligators while the rest of them were making puppies and and baby chicks and and stuff like that. That's hysterical. What a great what a great um setup. <laughs> Without, without that modular middle, though, without that progressive beating that that stork is taking and getting more and more and more ragged, I mean, by the end, he's got bags under his eyes, his feathers are falling out, it's hysterical. Without that, how do we show exactly how monumental a choice it is for him to just when it looks like he's leaving and he's gone and he's abandoned, he's abandoned his post as a delivery, a deliverer of babies, 
He shows up with that with that football helmet on in the pads, right? Hand me, hand me whatever that is. I'm ready to work, buddy. How much more satisfying is it as an audience to see that choice happen when we've grown to such a point that the, I mean, the audience wants them to go. The audience, by that point, the audience is like, listen, we understand. You can go. Listen, like, like just take a break or whatever. But man, you are just getting, you're just getting destroyed. I, I actually felt a little bit, not angry, but a little bit disappointed in the cloud that the cloud was so disappointed that this, the, the stork like was, was, was taking off. Little did he know he was leaving to go get some pads, but um, he seemed a lot less understanding of the situation than I, I thought he would be. Regardless of that, the modular middle is great because what it allows you to do is as you're creating your story, you can leave that kind of like up to, uh, up for later almost. You can skip over the middle if you've decided that it's modular. If you decided that we're going to have like a chase scene or you decided we're going to have like a, like a series of scenes in the middle where one person is trying to show someone else like how to do it. Um, and they just get more and more and more frustrated or they, you know, the other person like fails like even more like awfully as it goes on, right? What's a good example of that? How about the Pixar short film Lifted where the... Um, the little alien looks like he's in a driver's ed exam and he's trying to abduct the human and the human just like by the in the beginning he just bumps his head but by the end he's bouncing around the entire freaking um, house and like everything is getting destroyed right so if you decide that you're going to like no matter what you're going to do you know I'm going to progressively raise the stakes through a modular middle, then you can kind of like rest easy and say, okay, I know I am going to do that. Those stakes are going to be decided. I can just bounce back and forth quicker from theme to moral and back again and back again and back again. <clears throat> all right. I really want all of you to start thinking about a short film. I really do. I'd love it if... Um, you know, at some point this year when um, I, 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 I post these resources and I, I, I try, you know, I, I give you guys a way to get involved with each other, um, this site really turns around and, and kind of morphs into a place where everyone's really excited and, pr and presenting all of their ideas for the world to see, for each other to critique and, and work on with each other. Um, I want you to tell a story. At the very least, learning these tools and being a uh, more cognizant and more involved storyteller will be what kind of gives you a leg up in terms of uh, animating, especially in feature film and feature animation. Um, but um, even still, even if you're not, uh, you know, you haven't painted a bullseye on those those areas of animation. Even still, a great exercise for finding uh, a little bit more to put into your scene. And remember, more isn't just you know the the eyelash detail or the you know the little bit of overlap on the earlobe as the person you know turns in a in a 19 frame reaction shot. More is what's behind the entire scene and how your shot or your sequence or any part that you're working on fits into that climb towards that revelation. Um, I think it's a lofty goal. I think we should all kind of aspire to be, uh, you know, a, a, a community of storytellers. And that's hopefully um, what uh, you, you've gotten out of this lecture. I've been speaking for an hour. Um, uh, I'm very excited about this. If you want to hear more, um, I, I, I absolutely would love to uh, talk about this a little bit more. Maybe you can submit some questions in the form of ask video mail questions about stuff that I've said today. Also, you always have the resource wish list in the forums if you want to see a, a specific lecture. Um, we will be back to a little bit more of the technical stuff and Maya Demo's workflow um, next month, but um, I want to give you guys a heads up that my book is uh, coming out soon, and there's going to be a few changes around here and changes that I hope you guys um, take on and be a part of. 
um, with me. We can all grow together. It's been a blast. This is Kenny Roy. Thanks for watching. Good luck with your animation. And as always, rock on.